coagulation cascades, right? Uh, we talked about coagulation cascades. I just want to quickly remind you. So we have the intrinsic pathway, the extrinsic pathway. Intrinsic is slower, and it's stimulated by the factors that are present in the vessel. Extrinsic is faster, and it's stimulated by the factors, the tissue factor, basically. That's when the injury becomes significant enough to affect tissues and they both converge to a common pathway which starts with a prothrombin activator which activates prothrombin converting it into the thrombin um, and thrombin activates fibrinogen converting into the fibrin okay so that's we talked about clot retraction um, the role of plasmin for it. So plasmin, which basically destroys the fibrin. And now I wanted to mention a few things about uh, pathologies. The main pathology associated with clotting is called thrombocytopenia. Okay. It's a low platelet count. The main causes of thrombocytopenia are damages to bone marrow. If you think about it, all diseases that are associated with the abnormalities in the blood are basically associated with the abnormalities to the bone marrow. When bone marrow cells are dysfunctional, megakaryocytes wouldn't be produced to the significant amounts, they will not produce enough platelets, patients have thrombocytopenia. Infectious diseases, the most notable is Neisseria meningitidis or meningococcal infection. Systemic meningococcal infection leads to the thrombocytopenia. One of the main um, symptoms, signs should I say, associated with uh, thrombocytopenia and for the reference so thrombocytes is sort of another it's a synonym to platelets if you see the word penia it means low okay and if you see the word emia it means in the blood high in the blood does that make sense and I will come back to it later. So, what happens is when people have low platelet counts, blood clotting isn't happening in the way it's supposed to. Coagulation properties of blood aren't perfect and you have multiple very small hemorrhages. Those little tiny small hemorrhages called petechia. Does that make sense? Petechia. It's a hemorrhage, hemorrhage in the skin, basically. When blood vessels start to leak, and you see the hemorrhage in the skin. It doesn't... Hemorrhage happens all over the body. Petechia is the part that you actually see. Okay? Another possible cause for this is the liver um, dysfunction, you know, liver failure. Because in this case, liver does not produce vitamin K. And vitamin K is an important cofactor for um, coagulation process. Does that make sense so far? So that's the problem with platelets. The problem with fibrin, the problem with the uh, coagulation itself, as we discussed, is genetic hemophilia. Okay. Um, deficiency of different factors lead to hemophilia A, B, C, you know. And those conditions, unfortunately, unfortunately are really hard to treat. They are extremely expensive to treat uh, because you can buy, there are recombinant clotting factors, but as any recombinant protein, they cost a fortune. 
So the regular treatments are platelet transfusions. Um, now, I see that some of you donated blood today. That is terrific, absolutely. We have a blood drive here today and tomorrow. It's a pain in the ass to sign up. I mean, it's not a pain in the ass to sign up, but if you didn't sign up before, you're going to wait. Okay? I plan on donating tomorrow. I hope I can make it during the break. Um, if you have a chance to get to the American Red Cross facility, they can accept the platelet donation. They cannot isolate platelets from the whole blood that you donate. So it's, it should be a special donation. And platelets are priceless, basically. Not only people with hemophilia require them, think about people with different types of leukemias, different types of bone marrow abnormalities. Uh, when people, well, we'll talk about leukemia, give me a second. Okay, so platelet transfusions, right? Now, very fascinating condition, I love it, called disseminated intravascular coagulation. Now, this is a pretty neat thing if you think about the mechanism. So what happens is in usually disseminated intravascular coagulation is the result of sepsis or complications during pregnancy. I'm not talking about transfusion reactions because they relatively rare when people receive the blood transfusion. The blood type is matched, right? So mostly sepsis, which means generalized systemic bacterial infection. So here's what happens. When people develop sepsis, then platelets in practically all blood vessels start to form thrombi, which impairs the blood flow. Those gazillion of thrombi immediately activate clotting system usually via the intrinsic pathway. So all fibrin, you know, all fibrinogen, should I say, gets out of the blood. So blood, as a whole, becomes deprived of platelets, as a whole thing, and fibrin. So it becomes very, quote-unquote, leaky. And you have two... Uh, events that usually don't go together you have a ma you know massive thrombosis all over the place and at the same time you have a massive hemorrhage all over the place because this leaky blood starts to spill through the vessel walls because you know there's no there's no coagulation it, it's really leaky Does that make sense this is called disseminated intravascular coagulation this complication of sepsis is in the Notoriously hard to do anything about. Usually that's eventually. And when blood leaves the blood vessels, what happens to the blood volume? It decreases and patients develop hypovolemic shock. Okay? Blood pressure drops precipitously. There's also a song called Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation. If you brave enough, you can Google it on YouTube. It's performed by a progressive death metal band called Viremia. I can usually listen to about 5 to 10 seconds of that song. It's uh, very brutal. Now, those are pathologies. And I'm going to just talk to you quickly about some pathologies of the white blood cells. What do we call them? White blood cells. Pathologies of the white blood cells. Abnormal levels of How do we call white blood cells? Leukocytes. So what are the problems with them? Main problem. The first one that comes to mind. It starts with the same word. Le leukemia. Yes. Leukemia means... Leuco refers to the white blood cells. Emia means in the blood. Leukemia refers to abnormally high levels of white blood cells of different sorts. Leukemia can be acute, usually arises from T cells, T lymphocytes. Leukemia can be chronic, usually arises from B cells, so, so called chronic lymphoblastic leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. 
Uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia is very common in children. And if it's diagnosed properly, there is a good chance for survival. There's a good chance of treatment. Chronic lymphoblastic leukemia is more common in adults. And it's also treatable. And depending on the stage, depending on the severity, the um, survival chances, if it's diagnosed early and it is not very much progressed, then survival rates for people who receive proper treatment can be as high as 95%, five-year survival. So it's a really good chance to, to get in the remission. There are less frequent cases of acute monocytic leukemia when monocytes start to proliferate abnormally. And the main treatment, actually, well, yeah, well, we'll talk, let's talk about treatment for a few seconds. It's actually quite fascinating. So first of all, if you, if the patient has an abnormal amount, too much white blood cells, which organ doesn't work properly? Which organ is messed up? Where are they produced, those white blood cells? Hmm? Bone marrow, yeah. So bone marrow is messed up, right? So how do you treat it? You remove the bone marrow. You can do it with it. So there are several approaches. One approach is to kill bone marrow and see if you can, you basically eliminate practically all cells, both, you know, good one and a bad one, hoping that whatever is left are only good cells. This is achieved by drugs, so-called anti-proliferative drugs. It's actually interesting how they were discovered during the First World War, uh, Germans used mustard <coughs> gas on the, the polite forces. Okay, and there was a group of British physicians, pathologists, pathologists that were studying those who died after the gas attack, and they found fascinating thing that all bone marrow cells in those people were dead. They made a note and kind of forgot about it, but eventually someone suggested, well, how about we take the mustard gas, make some sort of a drug out of it, and try to treat leukemia with it, and it actually worked. Um, sometimes it doesn't help patients, then bone marrow is completely destroyed using radiation usually, or a combination of radiation and chemotherapy and the bone marrow transplant is introduced. Um, I think everybody should register as a possible bone marrow donor. It doesn't require anything, actually. I mean, I think you just have to register, sort of, you know. I'm good. And if there is a match with you, we will get a call or an email. Yes, the procedure of taking your bone marrow is painful, but you're not going to die, and it replenishes itself. You're not going to have 50% less bone marrow. Okay. Um, now, I kind of use this whole speech about leukemias. Segway. I'm going to make a plug for a book. Those of you who go into the health profession, very strongly recommend to read it. Like, it's one of the best books about medicine that I ever read. Those of you who were in my class before, you know what I'm going to talk about. It's called The Emperor of All Maladies. It's authored by... Uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, who is an actual physician and actual scientist at uh, Harvard Medical School. I don't really read any, any actually, any books that often, mostly you know, read papers, scientific, non-scientific papers, but I just don't have time for books. When I got this one, I couldn't go to sleep. 
not because it was so scary, but because it was so good. I could just and you can go on eBay, buy it used, paperback. It should cost like five bucks. I got. I was really impressed. You know, I got the the hardback for like twenty dollars, and it was new, so it shouldn't be that really expensive. Okay, read it. You want to be able. To, it's absolutely fascinating. It's a story of cancer. Or like biography of cancer. The great book. Now back to blood. Sometimes, as we discussed, clotting can be a problem. Okay? One of the what what is the biggest problem with clotting? What type of Condition, what type of event, types of events can be caused by abnormal clotting? Most common. I'm not talking about DIC. DIC is fairly rare. What can clot in the wrong place cause? Stroke or myocardial infarction, right? So people who are at high risk of clotting problems. People with atrial fibrillation, people with diabetes who develop peripheral artery disease, peripheral, sorry, peripheral vascular disease, PVD, uh, deep vein from people who may suffer from deep vein thrombosis. Those people usually receive different types of anticoagulants. The most well known is aspirin. Okay. Aspirin is the inhibitor of chamboxane A. And if we'll go back for a few steps, chromboxane A is a vasoconstrictor, and it also activates platelets. So it directly stimulates the thrombus formation, right? The initial, you know, when initially Bayer scientists discovered aspirin, it was used. For what? Control fever, right, and pain. Turns out from boxane A, it's generated by the uh, enzyme called cyclooxygenase. This enzyme generates other chemicals that produce fever and pain. So that's why aspirin works. But since then, it was discovered that it also decreases the coagulation clotting properties of platelets, and low doses they do decrease the risk of heart attack or stroke in men. Okay, and even so that in the event of stroke, doctors recommend, you know, there's a stroke recommend to give aspirin to a patient to reduce the possibility of more clots being formed. And now I'm going to be politically incorrect. There's a group of people called PETA, people eating tasty animals, that protect animals, right? And they suggest that no drugs should be tested on animals. And one of the American Heart Association conferences, American Heart Association, was giving out little bins for members to give the, this extreme animal protectors and every bean said in the case of a stroke don't give me aspirin because aspirin was tested on animals and technically they shouldn't take it you know now um, there are associated risks of course because if you make blood less coagulable then there are associated risks for bleeding um, people with, say, peptic ulcer shouldn't take aspirin because it increases the chances for bleeding ulcer. Another chemical that you may have heard about heparin, it's common anticoagulant, um, used during surgeries to prevent blood clotting, during the blood transfusions, it prevents blood from clotting, basically. That's it. Really good, really safe. Great chemical. Warfarin or Coumadin. 
So this is kind of a next generation um, inhibitor of the vitamin K that is used to treat patients with, say, atrial fibrillation to decrease the risk of stroke. Um, also, rat poison basically, you know, prevents rats from coagulation in the blood and kills them. It's pretty neat. The latest generation of um, anticoagulation drugs are thrombin inhibitors. So I have some here. So basically what they do, they just stop thrombin from working. Okay. You may have heard about the drug called Pradaxa, inhibitor of thrombin. Okay. Another clinically approved drug is Argetroban. And Hiridin, that's fascinating. Hiridin is the chemical isolated from some really unpleasantly looking animals. No guesses? Hirudo? Huh? Hirudo? Animals that suck your blood. And they prevent it from clotting because they need to suck it. Leeches. Okay? Leeches produce the actual anticoagulant that was isolated and turns out to be a thrombin inhibitor. Does that make sense? Um, wanted to say something. No, we're not going to talk about clinical studies. So we conclude with the blood and move on to the immune system. So, your body is well protected. There are multiple levels of protection. What's the first that comes to mind? Skin. Yep, skin. If you would look at uh, the main risks associated with burns, there are two things. First is dehydration, because skin generally prevents fluids to leave your body uncontrollably. The sec second, infections. People with the large burns, you know, when the large skin area is affected, they can pick up the infection practically from the thin air. So there are microbes circulating and people who are severely affected by the burns, they will be in basically sterile burn unit. The, the air will be at least disinfected if not sterilized. Mucus. Traps pathogens, traps dust, and you will find it, so we have a lot of mucus membranes, right? The entire digestive tract, the entire respiratory tract, your genital tract, okay? Um, my favorite one is, of course, uh, respiratory. So you have mucus lining up, you know, mucus produced by goblet cells that is released on, the mucus is released into the walls of, say, bronchioles. And whatever we inhale, whatever bad stuff gets there, it gets trapped in the mucus. And then what happens to that mucus? We don't cough it up. <clears throat> we can, if there is some irritation, then we cough it up or mucus accumulates to a large amount and we there is some irritation and we cough it up. But generally, we have cilia in the respiratory tract. Cilia propel the mucus upwards and there is a merging point, well, or should I say separation point, uh, at the bottom, the inferior part of your laryngopharynx. You know, when the respiratory part goes into the larynx and digestive part goes into the esophagus. So mucus reaches that point and it climbs all over the fence and you swallow it. And it goes to constantly swallow the mucus and it goes into the stomach and stomach acid. Yeah, stomach acid kills them. So, you know, and if your mom or somebody else told you not to swallow a snot, disregard it. You can't. It's fine. It's totally fine. 
Another place with low pH is vagina. And low vaginal pH is extremely important to ward off pathogens. Um, it is very well known that any kind of extended long-term antibiotic therapy that affects vaginal microbes, vaginal microbes actually create the slow pH. It's not something given. So <clears throat> let me explain. Stomach pH is not microbe related. Does that make sense? Stomach pH is the result of your prenatal cells in action. Vaginal pH is the result of fermenting microorganisms that produce lactic acid. If those microorganisms are killed, no lactic acid, no low pH, and a bunch of pathogenic microbes will start to invent. Okay. Um, on the skin, we have other methods to get rid of pathogens. So, <clears throat> first of all, sebaceous gland produces fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids are antibacterial. Um, Dermicidins in the sweat, antibacterial proteins. Lysozymes. Lysozymes are found in practically every secretion from mucus to tears to nasal secretions to saliva. Uh, the story of science is a romantic story of the lysozyme discovery states that there was a, a microbiologist, he leaned over the plate of Staph aureus and the tear dropped on the plate and created the inhibition zone, so microbes died. Sounds very romantic. Another story which I believe more, uh, he had runny nose, so he sneezed. His nasal secretions went directly onto the plate and killed the microbes. So why is that? Um, well, and of course, since it's not microbiology class, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about microbiome, but always keep in mind, don't be too clean. I'm dead serious. If you wash yourself every day, you actually make yourself more at risk for microbial invasion. By washing, of course, I mean not just standing under the running water, but actually using soap. Does that make sense? There was one guy that suggested that actually the optimal frequency is once every week. Yeah, yeah, I to I, I'm totally with you. You know, if we would if we would just synchronize, that would be nice. You know, like everybody goes in the shower on like Sunday night, and then we all get dirty, you know, through the week. So we'll get used to the smell. And otherwise, it would be unbearable. Yeah. So, immune system per se can be divided into the innate and adaptive. We're going to talk about innate first. Innate immune system is the one that you're born with. It's already there. It doesn't require any exposure. Okay. It protects regardless of the pathogens, which makes it actually non-specific. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? So innate responses do not differ much between pathogens. Your innate immune system will respond in a practically similar fashion to all the viruses to all the bacteria, to all fungi, okay, which makes it not as effective. And it's usually not a systemic response, it's a local response. So when we talk about inflammation, that is actually an innate immunity. So we're gonna, now we're going to come back to the cells, white blood cells that we talked about, and look, they function. You've already encountered them and this will not sound entirely unfamiliar new to you. Neutrophils found in the circulation 
protect against the bacteria. And the protection is through the phagocytosis. I want to specifically highlight this one. Respiratory bursts, so they produce chemicals, oxidative chemicals that kill cells. I, I was talking about neutrophil extracellular traps, DNA, they throw onto other cells. And they can non-specifically increase inflammation. Asinophils. There's going to be a lot of clinical stuff here. I'm going to talk a lot about clinical things. Again, circulation. Now, these guys respond to fungal infections, protozoan infections, filamentic infections. Um, the deal is that not every helminthic or fungal or protozoan infection will increase the number of eosinophils in the blood. Do I make sense? But if you see high eosinophils in the blood, then you may say, if we suspect infection, it's probably helminths or protozoa or fungi. Okay? Now, we talked about that they cannot phagocytose. They're going to just bother the bugs. They're going to release chemicals that are toxic to the invader, hoping that it's going to die or it's going to leave. As in the fields, again, they do not phagocytose. Unfortunately, these cells also mediate allergy. In pediatric patients with allergic asthma, number of eosinophils found in the lamina propria of bronchioles and bronchi, so basically in the mucosa of respiratory tract, number of eosinophils there is much higher than in the patients without allergic asthma. Make sense? Basophils. Again, circulation. When I say allergies, you have to understand. Basophils contribute to generally inflammatory process, but um, they can mediate allergy. Basically, when you have an allergy, what is it? Conceptually, what is allergy? Is that immune response? Yes. To what? Huh? Say again? Something that you're not supposed to respond, right? Like, we're not supposed to respond to peanut butter. Okay? We're not supposed to respond to cat dander. Okay? But we do. And that's allergy. And mast cells that I mentioned, that's like basophils, but in the tissue, these are totally allergy. So mast cells are totally allergic response. Here's the little question. I want to start with eosinophils. So they respond to helminthic infections, and protozoan infections, and fungal infections. We do have fungi from time to time, you know, especially if you're an athlete and you spend some time in the locker rooms, in locker room showers, you can get fungus. I totally get it. Protozoa, without saying in helminths? I'm not going to ask my regular question. Who in the classroom has worms? Nobody does. But, come on. Who, do you know someone, or how many people do you know who had helminthic infestations? I doubt it. I really doubt that you know anyone. We all have one when we kids, don't take me wrong, there's a pinworm. Virtually every person in the world has pinworms as a kid. And then they leave. We don't know why they go away, but it's fine. But something more serious? No. We live in a clean society. We have a lot of allergies, a lot of allergies, a lot of autoimmune diseases, but we're clean. If you would go to a place like Africa, Southeast Asia, especially rural areas, 
he will struggle to find someone with asthma or eczema, psoriasis, or any other autoimmune condition for that matter. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of filmintic infections. Some of them are pretty notorious. Some of them, I would probably take asthma over it, to be honest. But nevertheless, you can hardly find any autoimmune diseases. There's a hypothesis called hygiene hypothesis, which suggests, and it's hard to test, but suggests that our cleanliness contributes to our autoimmune diseases. Basically, if your parents kept you very, very clean when you were growing up and you didn't eat dirt, then you have higher chances to develop asthma, psoriasis, or eczema, and vice versa. If you just, you know, crawled around and, you know, got everything in your mouth and was outside playing with the dirt and got all covered in mud, then you have less chances to develop autoimmune disease. There are some sort of retrospective observational studies that show that it might be true. Okay? Does that make sense? And actually, there, there were studies, <coughs> kind of prove that hypothesis even more, people with inflammatory bowel disease got infected with a helminth called a whipworm, and the symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease subsided for about three years. They returned back, but something happens. Our immune system needs that stimulation that we don't get anymore. Does that make sense? Now, <clears throat> you remember monocytes and macrophages. Cells that are intimately connected. Monocytes differentiate into the macrophages. And macrophages, phagocytes. Okay. Monocytes found in circulation and Macrophages are in tissues, should be direct here, okay? And I told you the difference between two main phagocytic cells. Neutrophils are one and done, and macrophages can phagocytose multiple times. Does that make sense? Now, the last type that I want to mention, we didn't talk about. Natural killer or NK cells. Cells are small. They actually, okay, these cells look like lymphocytes. Very much like lymphocytes. Okay? NK cells in the bottom. It can be found in a circulation. And they have a certain degree of specificity. They destroy virus-infected cells or cancer cells. What they essentially do, think about this, they survey the body and virus-infected cells and cancer cells have certain surface markers, like molecules on the surface, that differentiate them from the healthy tissue. Do I make sense? So basically, if this is healthy, Okay, this is healthy, like I'm a healthy cell, I'm a cancer cell. That makes sense. I mean, I look generally the same, but I have some other labels on the outside. Good? So NK cells, what they do, they approach, quote unquote, I make them look like they like little tiny Oompa Loompas, they not, but it approaches approaches the cell and it establishes a contact with it through the receptor ligand interaction nothing fancy so two molecules interact okay and then it causes apoptosis okay so basically like it touches the cell and cell dies there is another way that they use nk cells can produce special proteins called perforins what do you think they do? Go, say it. 
Say again? Perforate. Yes. Perforins perforate the abnormal cell. And then other proteins called granzymes, they enter the abnormal cell and also cause apoptosis. Basically, NK cells cause the cell death without any phagocytosis. They just sort of acquired suicide of the abnormal, infected or cancerous cell. Does that make sense? Any questions? Please tell me. I think we got it pretty well. So please know the functions of those cells. Okay? And whether they can be found in the tissue or in the circulation. We're good? We have discussed inflammation. I'm not going to go back to it again. I want to talk a little bit more about phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is fairly non-specific process. What I mean by that? Yeah, we tried it last year. didn't work yet. I need to figure out the conditions. But you can basically mix blood and bacteria on the slide and look at it under the microscope. And you can see macrophages, neutrophils, eating the cells. Like, really, you can see it. I had some other problems trying to make it work, but you can do it, okay? And it doesn't really matter which bacteria you use. So phagocytosis is quite unspecific. Phagocyte, let's say macrophage, right? It binds to the bacterial cells, forms pseudopodia, false legs, pseudopodia engulf the pathogen and bring it in in the form of phagosome, membrane-bound vesicle. Phagosome merges with another vesicle called lysosome, and lysosome contains all kinds of stuff. It contains hydrogen peroxide, it contains bleach, it contains enzymes, that destroy virtually everything, you know. And then whatever is left, the debris is released from macrophage and it keeps going. However, if it's not a macrophage, if it's a neutrophil, then neutrophil dies. It phagocytoses and dies. Does that make sense? Now, of course, there's a question, little question. How phagocytes know that whatever they're about to phagocyte is bacteria? Turns out all microorganisms have sort of unique chemical signatures. I'm not going to ask this on the exam. Don't worry, because it would require a lot of explanation. I just want you to understand. Let me tell you something. Um, do you know all dog breeds? All of them? Do you know all of them? Like all that exist in the world? No? If you will see a dog of a breed that you have no idea about, you'll be able to tell that that's a dog. Oh yeah, you know, you know, four legs, ears, like certain, you know, appearance, right? They can look very, very different. So they all have certain signatures, quote unquote. Does that make sense? Bacteria are the same, and fungi are the same, and all microorganisms are the same. Like all fungi have something in common. All bacteria have something in common. All viruses have something in common. Do I make sense? Macrophages can recognize this common. They can say, okay, that's the pathogen. Uh, my cells do not have this. 
My cells do not have those chemicals, molecules, whatever, on their surface. Does that make sense? Okay? That's how macrophage work. Questions? Steps of phagocytosis? Absolutely. This recognition mechanism? I'm not going to ask this. Deal? Compliment. For some reason, I just like this system. It, it looks <coughs> ancient. It really is. Basically, <coughs> complement is a bunch of proteins in the plasma. They are in the blood. They're not associated with the cells. Okay? And if you activate those proteins, they will initiate several protective mechanisms. Now, what I specifically want you to know. First, I want you to know three pathways, three mechanisms, how complement can be activated. Classical pathway. When complement proteins are activated, by the antibody antigen complexes. We didn't talk about antibodies yet. Antibodies activate complement. Then there is lectin pathway. Some pathogens carry a molecule called mannose, binds to the lectin, and activates the pathway. That makes sense. So have classical pathway by the antibodies. You have lectin pathway by a binding of mannose to lectin. And then you have alternative pathway, which is probably the easiest to remember because it's just some stuff on the pathogen surface. Nothing really, really specific, like you can say there's a whole class. Just some molecules can initiate alternative pathway. So far, am I clear in the pathway breakdown? So three pathways. Each pathway initiates a cascade of events. Remember uh, coagulation thing? The cascade is when previous protein activates the next one and then it activates the next one. That's what happens in complement activation. You don't need to know the sequence. What I do want you to know is that all three pathways converge on the C3 protein, C3 convertase. And once they converge on it, there are several possible outcomes. And I do want you to know these outcomes. I'm going to ask about the outcomes. Outcome number one. Inflammation, you can write down just inflammation, okay? Outcome number two, new word for you, obscenization. So I'm going to tell you what it means, obscenization. You know, when you, when you go to the department store and you pick up an item, say shoes or you know piece of clothing they have this plastic thing attached to it if you will try to open it to remove it it will splash an ink labeling you does that make sense to prevent from from stealing okay so obscenization is the process when the pathogen so imagine this is the, the pathogen is surrounded by the complement proteins. Do I make sense? These complement proteins basically label the pathogen for immune cells as the target for phagocytosis. 
Does that make sense? It's like tagging, okay? And the, the word opsonization refers not specifically to the complement, because antibodies can do it as well. Opsonization means, actually, this surrounding thing. You got it? Whatever sticks to the pathogen and labels it, that's opsonization. Are we clear about it? Some complement proteins can activate phagocytes. And then the ultimate, I wouldn't say ultimate outcome, but kind of cool outcome, is membrane attack complex. Several complement proteins, they assemble a pore, bless you, <clears throat> and this pore creates a hole in the membrane where water and ions can move through. Now you can imagine this doesn't end well for the cell that has this membrane attack complex in it. Does that make sense? So it's either going to burst or it's going to collapse due to that unknown. Low iron concentration is going to lose the membrane potential, or you know, there's going to be some inhibitory effect. Something's going to happen. Okay, basically, this membrane attack complex pierces the membrane in multiple spots. Does that make sense? Now, why I say it's uh, it's the ancient ancient system, because if you would look at the the primitive organisms, like some arthropods, especially the marine arthropods, for them, this is one of the main components of the immune response. Okay? And if you would look at the animals that are more complex, you know, they start to develop adaptive immunity, antibodies, T cells, blah, blah, blah. So it's old and primitive, but you know, that's, that's nature. Nature is bureaucratic. It works. Yep. Why don't we keep it? Sure thing. Okay. Interference are proteins. Here's what happens. When tissue get infected, whether the pathogens are outside of the cells or inside of the cells, especially when cells are infected inside. Outside can also happen, don't get me wrong, but when tissue is infected, cells that are infected or that are near to the pathogens, okay, they can start producing interference. So this example on the right shows you the virus infection, which triggers the interferon production. So basically what cell does it um, when it's infected, okay, when cell is infected, it starts to produce interference. Interference will not kill anything, they will not prevent the infection in that same cell, but interference will go into the blood and will warn other cells. So they can act as endocrine mediators, basically hormones. They can also interact with the receptors. Like here, interferon interacts with the receptor. They can interact with the receptors on the adjacent cell, so they can work in a paracrine fashion. Sometimes they can bind to the receptor on that exact same cell basically acting in an autocrine fashion. What interference do? Like, think about it. Like, uh, I was beaten by a zombie in the hallway, and I walk in the class, and I know that in about 15 minutes I'm going to turn into a zombie. So I walk in the class, and I tell you, run, you fools, you know, and you leave. So I'm warning you. Nothing can save me, but you can be saved. And you know that, I tell you, you know, there is a zombie in the hallway. 
So not just blindly stepping out there, you are warned and prepared. Interferon warns and prepares are the cells. There are two major types of interferon. One and two. I think it's very creative naming. Okay. Uh, you may have heard about alpha and beta interference. They fairly common in a clinical practice. Um, and there's type two, which is mostly gamma interferon. Um, so yeah, they will stimulate. They will kind of bump up the cellular responses, intracellular responses. So cell either prevent pathogen from entering or when pathogen enters cell can destroy it and or go into apoptosis for that matter that makes sense it's a perfectly legitimate way to get rid of an infection if the cell is infected it dies and the pathogen dies with it okay so you can use it as a drug yes is it good no. Um, it used to be used to treat cancers, and for, for some time interferon was used to treat viral infections. So exotic viral infections like yellow fever, for instance, dengue, were often treated with interferon. Uh, meh. I worked on yellow fever for about two and, and a change, two years and a change, and we kind of we showed it was in a it was a model. Don't get me wrong, it was a model. It wasn't humans, but in the model, what we showed that if you take cells and pre-treat them with interferon and then infect, they perfectly protected. They just great. But if you take cells, infect them and then treat them with interferon 36 hours later, interferon has no effect. So basically what you need to do, you either have to know exactly the time when you're going to get infected, which is impossible, or say you go to some, like, there's influenza epidemic, okay? You take interferon every day, which is a horrible idea. Because one of the, there are many side effects. Physiologically, like constipation, uh, blood problems, but one of the most notable side effects of interferon therapy is depression. Very severe clinical depression. Okay. Now, do we still use, yes, some infections that we don't have any other therapy for? We used it for a very long time to treat hepatitis C infection. And <clears throat> Initially, when hepatitis C was discovered, it was actually the only option for treatment. The rates of recovery were absolutely dismal. For interferon alone, we're talking 10 to 20 percent. And now we have perfect drugs, so we don't need it. Seriously. I mean, if you get hepatitis, I'm not saying that you start using drugs right now because you can get rid of hepatitis C. But hepatitis C is completely treatable now. If you have a health insurance, by the way. Because the cost of treatment is about $40,000 a year. So. Now, innate immunity was fairly short. It's small. We're going to spend the majority of our time here talking about immunity. We're going to spend it on the adaptive. Okay, so innate immunity is something like this insecticide that you can buy for, I don't know, 10 bucks at Lowe's. It says it's insecticide. It's kind of, you know, kills everything. Adaptive, well, and it's kind of lousy, right? I mean, it's not that terrific, okay? 
Adaptive immunity is something like a pest control that you call an order. You know, you tell them, look, I have a, a nest of wasps in my backyard. And they will come with the tools specifically for that nest. They're not going to deal with your sugar ants or, I don't know, something else. They're going to come for these wasps. And if you tell them, look, and I also have a problem with the sugar ants in the kitchen, he'll say, well, sorry, I have to come back, get another set of tools, another set of chemicals, and go back to your house. We do not have them. So that's your adaptive immunity. So it's very specific. It is actually targeted against a specific pathogen, but it needs that phone call. It requires the exposure to the antigen, the talk with the antigen. And since, look, if you have, you go to Home Depot, you know, Lois, you, I don't want to promote one, one brand, um, you get the insecticide, you spray, you're good. It takes you, what, 20 minutes, maybe more, take drive time. With pest control, you need to make a call. They will tell you, we can do it today. You need to schedule an appointment. It's going to be like on Friday and blah, blah, blah. So it takes time. So adaptive immunity is slower. But it is more effective. And the most awesome feature adaptive immunity. It forms immunological memory. Which means if you were exposed to a pathogen once in general at second exposure your immune system will protect you faster and stronger. It's not always true but generally it is true. What are the cells of adaptive immunity? Those are lymphocytes. As any other <clears throat> immune white blood cells, they originate in the bone marrow. That's the nursery. They're all born in Cleveland, okay, in bone marrow. And then B cells, they go to Cleveland State. They stay in the bone marrow. And they mature there, get educated. You know, learn how to fight. T cells, though, they go into the Ohio State University. So they move to Columbus. T cells go to thymus, a small, fairly small endocrine gland that we talked about before, located in the superior mediastinum, up here. Okay. And T cells get their education in the thymus, therefore, the names. T cells and B cells. And after the maturation in bone marrow or thymus, they enter the lymphatic system. This is called seeding. They seed the lymphatic system. And in the lymphatic system, they wait. They wait. For the pathogen. Why do they wait for the pathogen in the lymphatic system? What is the function of the lymphatic system? We mentioned it briefly when we talked about tissue perfusion. All crap goes in there, you're absolutely right. It's a drainage, it's a sewage. So, kind of all bad stuff that is in all places in the body eventually makes its way into the lymphatic system. That's where T and B cells are. That makes sense. <clears throat> when they get exposed to a pathogen, they proliferate and differentiate. Again, let's remind ourselves. Differentiation means that cell becomes more specialized. Proliferation means that cell becomes... Huh? Not in the size, but in. See again? Numbers. Perfect. Not in the size, but in numbers. So those cells start to divide. 
Does that make sense? It's like, you know, uh, when they expose, like you have instead of one fighter, they start to reproduce, they start to clone themselves. And that's actually the name, they produce a clone, a clonal population. Does that make sense? So that's the brief outline of the, the whole process of cell development. And we're going to talk more about some features of adaptive immune response. Because honestly, the main thing that you're going to talk to your patients and you will become health professionals, aspects of their adaptive immune response, seriously. And we need to start with a talk about antigen. We're going to talk about antigen and then we're going to take a break. So antigen is the molecule that is large and complex. So there are two conditions for something to be antigen. Protein, DNA, complex, huge carbohydrate molecule can all be antigens. Does that make sense? Water molecule isn't an antigen. It's small and simple. Does that make sense? And, you know, smaller, the smaller and simpler the molecule, the less likely you're going to produce any kind of immune response to it. And you have to understand that antigen means that this molecule comes from some other foreign source. Okay? So let's talk about it a little bit. So say if one of you would donate blood, you know, blood would be separated into plasma and formed elements. Somebody would isolate albumin from your plasma and I will receive your albumin. Will it be a good antigen for my immune system? A good antigen. Compared to say mouse albumin, which one would be stronger antigen? Which one would be more antigenic, mouse or human? It's not that foreign. Mouse is much more foreign. Does that make sense? The foreigner, the molecule, the better it as an antigen. The more alien it is, you know, basically, the, the an antigenic molecule is alien to us. I mean, sometimes the difference can be very, very subtle. When we talk about organ transplant, yeah, other person is foreign enough. When we talk about an individual protein molecule, it should be fine. Okay. That makes sense. Now, each antigen has a number of antigenic determinants. Antigenic determinants are the parts of the antigen that your immune system recognizes. Let me explain using my favorite tool. Um, when you you know, it's like um, it's like features. Specific features of a person. So, like, all proteins have amino acids and stuff. But each protein has its own antigenic determinants, maybe two, three things. So basically, when you ask someone, you know, how am I going to recognize you on the street? People will not tell you, you know, well, yeah, I'm going to have two legs, two arms, and a head. That's kind of very vague description. They will, for instance, tell you, I'm going to wear a, a red coat or a fedora, you know, some very specific individual signs. That's antigenic determinant. This is how your immune system recognizes them. Okay? Immune system doesn't try to recognize each and every element of a protein, each and every amino acid. It recognizes certain features of it. Does that make sense of a protein? Okay? So, when immune system recognizes 
antigenic determinant, produces the response and forms a memory. So as I mentioned, complete antigens are large and complex molecules such as proteins or DNA. Some big molecules are not antigenic. Take polyethylene. I guess this may be polyethylene. The bottles are most likely polyethylene. In this plastic bottle, this plastic bottle. Poly means many. So polyethylene is a material that consists of huge polymer molecules. Are they big? Absolutely. Are they complex then? They aren't. They're really simple. That's why they aren't antigenic. Does that make sense? Okay, so polyethylene or like... Uh, Nitrile gloves. Nitrile gloves are made of the polymer. Molecules are huge, but they are simple, so we don't have the allergy to them. There is no immune response possible to them. There are, though, molecules that are complex but small. Say, a hormone. Maybe this. <clears throat> the small complex molecules that we want to produce antibodies against, called haptines. So, haptine, by itself, cannot produce immune response. But when haptine is attached to a large molecule, it can. Do you understand the idea? We take a small molecule, a small, so this is a small molecule. This cup is a small molecule. It's too small for your immune system to recognize it. You don't see it. But if it is attached to a large molecule, then your immune system can recognize it and produce immune response to it. From the diagnostic side, it's really convenient. You can make antibodies that will recognize like hormones and will let you to detect them. From the clinical perspective, this is how you develop allergies and other abnormal immune responses, like um, poison ivy and chemical from poison ivy sticks to your proteins. By itself, it's small, but when it is attached to your own like blood proteins, like your albumin, your immune system starts to recognize that chemical and starts to build up the immune response to it and you develop this this terrible terrible condition does that make sense questions about the antigens okay we can take a break and when we'll come back we'll chat about the um t-cell